Alone in the Indian Ocean drifting, British seaman Gunnar Horace Bailey clung to life. It had now been five days since the sinking on the 20th of March 1943. His hopes were now fading. Dehydration, the punishing sun, the wounds to his legs and hands would likely now finish him off. The ominous feeling overcame him. This would be his last day for sure. And what he had witnessed would die with him. His only blessing was his raft. The sturdy hull section of a landing craft that had been deck cargo on his vessel, the SS Fort Mumford, the solace, at least someone would find his body. The names of Bailey's fellow New Zealand crewmates who had perished, or at least presumed dead, on board SS Fort Mumford were about to be published in NZ papers. The five Kiwis had come on board at Littleton after departing Vancouver on the maiden voyage to Aden. Five of the fifty. Eric Balfour was just seventeen. Fellow Cantabrian Andrew Beatty, a couple of years older. Ian Hayward, who went under the name Bell. He called Palmerston North his home, 22. Kenneth Cook from Omaru, 20. William Glennie from Napier was the oldest Kiwi to perish at 31. How many of these merchant seamen managed to survive the initial torpedoing by the Japanese sub, like Bailey, is open to speculation. After hauling himself onto his makeshift raft, Bailey had gone in and out of consciousness. Amongst the mayhem and wreckage, recalls yelling for anyone else on the surface. That's when he spotted the submarine then decided, for good reason, to shut up and pretend to be dead. In March of 1942, the Germans asked their new allies to form a submarine force based in Penang with the Pacific task of attacking vessels travelling in aid of Britain and her allies. In essence, attack the allies' supply lines, as well as to also supply Indian nationals fighting the British. Prior to the squad's establishment, there had been a smaller force operating along the same lines out of Malaysia, comprising a smaller number of Japanese subs as well as German and Italian ones. The 8th submarine squadron of the Imperial Japanese Navy wasn't large by, say, German U-boat standards. 17 submarines, of which only one, I-165, would survive to the end of the war which is frankly a pity. She was known to be one of the submarines of the 8th Squadron, who will be the focus of this video. The captain and crews of which, after crippling or sinking vessels, decided to mercilessly murder or injure the stricken survivors. 8th Squadron was notorious for their brutality. The major reason why their name doesn't live in infamy like it should was the guilty parties would be killed before the end of the war. Let's start with the sordid exploits of I-165, because I've touched on her already. On March the 18th, 1944, I-165 put two torpedoes into the British merchant ship Nancy Muller on her way between Durban and Ceylon. She sank in short fashion before proper evacuation could be executed, before the lifeboats could all be lowered. In the waters, the survivors located anything they could to stay afloat, including upturned lifeboats, improvised rafts, etc. Now on the surface, I-165 proceeded menacingly to travel around the remaining groups, seeking to locate the highest ranking crew member for interrogation purposes. After being frustrated, the crew were hiding the captain and navigator, etc. They opened fire on the hapless survivors with their high calibre anti-aircraft gun, casually working their way amongst the surface debris, picking people off. 19 would be killed, and the other survivors would be rescued six days later. Nor was that an isolated incident. A month prior, in February, I-37 struck the SS British Chivalry. 53 members of the tanker made it into two lifeboats. In a repeat of the previous incident, 
with the exceptions that the rescued vessel was sort of float and needed to be finished off and the sub's crew did some pirating for good measure taking watches and jewellery I-37 callously opened fire on the lifeboats killing 13 and wounding 5 and they repeated their war crime and two days later, the 24th, on the defenseless sailors who made it off the vessel spelt S-U-T-E-J. I'm not brave enough to have a go at that one. Cripes, I already get enough critical comments in some quarters for running a New Zealand YouTube channel and having shock horror, a New Zealand accent. Some people really need to go out for a long walk now and again, or drink more. Moving past the village idiots with the internet. The survivors of the steamer SS Ascot were the next to experience the brutality of the crew on board I-37 five days later. There was, by the way, perchance another vessel with the identical name Ascot that traipsed New Zealand and Australian waters at one point and even took part in transporting troops to Gallipoli landings in World War One. That wasn't it. I-37 tortured the captain and then went about machine gunning all but eight. There's a link on your screen to an eyewitness account. As if you need further evidence put to bed any considerations, those were just random acts by rogue commanders. We get to I-8. I'm not going to cover what happened to the crew of the Liberty ship Jean Nicolette when they too had the misfortune to encounter I-8. Suffice to say, it's just as horrific as what befell the Dutch freighter with the Javanese name, the G. Salah. March the 26th, 1944, the outgun crew of the G. Salah put up a gallant but ultimately futile fight against I-8. 105 made it off the stricken vessel. They were rounded up and placed on the deck of the submarine in pairs and then systematically killed with an array of weapons from sidearms to monkey wrenches. Those that weren't killed outright, wounded, were kicked off the sub as shark bait. Four of those would somehow survive and swim back to the wreckage and be rescued. When the sadistic crew were down to the last 20, they tied a rope around them and then crash dive dragging them all underneath. Incredibly, one of those would detach himself and survive as well. 100 wouldn't. All those war crimes had occurred in 1944. And that wasn't when the file had begun on the actions of what they knew to be the pernicious, now notorious, 8th Submarine Squadron. Frankly, I'm running out of pejoratives to describe these individuals. What the hell was going on on the heads of Japanese people back then? That began at the end of March in 1943, when an Arabian Dao had delivered a half-dead sailor into the port town of Mikandani in Tanganyika, the sole survivor and witness to the massacre of the crew of the SS Fort Mumford. There was one major hole in that sailor's testimony, and why they couldn't make progress bringing about justice. One that wouldn't definitively be sorted till the end of the war when Japanese records could be accessed. That's to say, what sub was it? Viewers would no doubt already be aware, as clear were British authorities, the Japanese emblazoned their coning towers with a fairly obvious identifying number, like 25 in this case. Bailey was too busy and playing dead to look up and get a sight of that. If he had risked his neck doing so, he would have seen that the numbers 2 followed by 7. I-27 was already on the radar of the Allies, the metaphorical radars of the officials, and then there was also the literal sonar operating from two of their destroyers, as you're about to find out. Their commander, Toshiaki Fukumara, was also a familiar name for all the wrong reasons. This was the sub made famous as one of the three motherships that released midget subs from their decks into Sydney Harbour in 1942. I-27 was also responsible for the third greatest loss of life at sea for the Allies in the Second World War. From memory, Hood Zero Bismarck 10 was the greatest single loss of life as well as being the largest loss of life and for service women in action amongst the Commonwealth forces at the same time. This action though led to the sub's demise. 
I'm talking about the sinking of the converted ocean liner, now troop ship, Kidev Ismail. The vessel, originally named after a mountain called Aconcagua in the Andes, has an interesting story. As it went through a succession of owners who invariably all went bust. Chilean, Scottish, Egyptian, thus the name, now back to British. By the 5th of February 1944, 130 metre long requisition Khedive Ismail had been in the British Navy for four years, was well known to Anzacs having been in the Med and evacuated troops out of Greece at one point. The day she was torpedoed by I-27, she was carrying 1,348 crew and passengers, mostly troops from East Africa, and as highlighted, a fair few wrens. Nor was she on her lonesome in the Indian Ocean. On that planned trip between Mombasa, Kenya to Colombo, Ceylon, the Kidev Ismail was part of a convoy codenamed KR-8, which turned out to be a real shit show for two reasons. Number one, the convoy got out of kilter. That lack of a defensive perimeter led to the sinking and just 214 survivors. In the aftermath, there was a major hauling over the coals of those on the bridges of the heavy cruiser HMS Hawkins. The destroyer Petard and her sister destroyer the Paladin sent to protect the five troop transports. You'll find out the second reason for the subsequent inquiry shortly when Fukumara and the hundred crew of I-27 saw the Kidev Ismail through their periscope. She and her fellow troop come supply ships looked for all intents on their Todd, unprotected. In fact, it was the crew of the Kidev Ismail that spotted I-27 first and opened fire, which did get the attention of her escorts. I-27 lined her up and sent a spread of four torpedoes, two of which struck the vessel with devastating effect. And that painting sums up the scene. The vessel broke in two and sank in three minutes, and whilst I couldn't establish this as a fact, there was a good chance the catastrophic explosion was a result of ammunition being carried, igniting. Most on board didn't stand a chance. The four other troop ships scattered with the cruiser Hawkins as protection. The destroyers Paladin and Petard were tasked with rescuing the survivors and locating the submarine. I-27 would make their task a lot easier by surfacing in the belief they would have a free reign as in the past, only to find the petard bearing down on them. They dived under the flotsam and jetsam of what remained of Kidev Ismail, hid below the survivors bobbing up and down as well. This is where I'm about to introduce the second reason why there was an inquiry into convoy at KR-8. Whilst there is little doubt it was a case of damned if you do and damned if you don't for the two destroyers, that was the balance between rescuing the crew versus the risk posed by the submarine, the laying down of depth charges by the petard, the screws and wakes of that destroyer bent on locating and sinking the submarine resulted in collateral deaths for the crew and passengers. The third run of depth charges of the petard hit their mark. The damaged I-27 was forced to the surface. That's an actual photo. You can see the smoke rising out of the turret. The Paladin now ceased her rescue mission and joined in shelling the crippled craft, then decided to bravely, or full-heartedly, depending on which way you looked at it, ram the submarine. That picture isn't exactly to scale in terms of bulk. Oh, sure, I-27 was about the same length as the two destroyers at roughly 110 metres long. However, the sub was a thousand tonnes heavier, resulting in the Paladin coming off second best when they went head to head, hull to hull. In the end, it was a torpedo from the petard that sank I-27. The whole engagement lasted two and a half hours, so this is very much a Reader's Digest overview of the events. There would be one survivor from the sub, who was picked up. So, so it was, was just served. 
let me indicate, not all Japanese submariners acted carelessly, even the ones in the same squadron. For the perpetrators, though, of the crimes I've outlined, the sons of a nation that reveres the attributes of a pride and honour, I hope those crew members are forever remembered as being cowards. In the words of Pink Floyd, I mean that most sincerely. Before you shoot off, don't you dare go off now and look at a cat video just yet. When I've got two tasty treats I'd like to tempt you with in the same genre. Jelly meat for dinner. Operation Struggle. When British XE mini subs made a perilous journey into what was Japanese occupied Singapore Harbour in the closing weeks of the war, medals galore were accumulated from their daring operation. The executions and attempted cover up of the seven Brits and two Kiwis dubbed the Palembang Nine, disturbingly, a crime that occurred after the war had ended. On behalf of the research team, me, the production team, me. Thanks heaps for those who view, like and subscribe. Bye for now.